unlike other forms of culture, you know, like movies that can play in repertory or plays that can be revived, uh, restaurants are ephemeral. You know, you you can bring back a restaurant, but it's not it's not really ever going to be the same twice. And so I think restaurants are very prone to being forgotten. This is Taste. I'm your host, Matt Rodbard. Matthew Schneier is currently the chief restaurant critic at New York Magazine and previously reported on fashion and culture at The Cut and The New York Times. Matthew joined us in the studio to talk about the job he took over a little more than six months ago. We discussed putting his own unique stamp on the coverage, what he looks for in both old and new New York City restaurants to review, and how he came to the job in the first place. Matthew is one of my favorite writers around, and it was so great catching up with him. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Matthew Schneier, welcome to This Is Taste. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. It's really cool to meet you. We've not met in person, but I, I feel like I know about you, uh, know you through your words and through your reporting. Huge fan. I love what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. How's the job in general? I mean, the full-time chief restaurant critic in New York Magazine, um, a big job, lots of profile, but it's also just a lot of meals. So how, how are you handling that? You know, I think the the biggest change for me is is just a sort of constant low grade uh, indigestion, and and if that's if that's the worst of it, I, I consider myself very lucky. I think this is uh, the best job in media, maybe the best job in New York. Full stop. Uh, you know, I'm only kind of six months in to the whole thing, so I'm still settling in, but mostly it's a, a sort of pinch myself experience and uh you know hopefully it's it's providing some reader service to everybody who who comes to new york magazine all of its various forms and uh you know it's it's great for me i hope it's great for everybody else yeah i mean six months in your your the training wheels are off you're you're, you're in it a, a review a review dropped today and we'll we'll get to it um a little bit john george you reviewed john george uh, 425. Yes, the yeah. new the new place from from the Jean George Sorry. group. And yes, it's uh, Jonathan Benno is is the Benno is the guy, but John George's group. So he took on like one of the the heavies. So we'll get to that. I don't want to like, I don't want to like get into that right away. I want to get into how you interviewed for this job. It's very, you you come from the New York Times. I read your work in style. I read your work throughout the magazine. You you really um, have a sense of profile. You're just a, a tremendous reporter. Um, but then the criticism job is different. It, it requires a lot of different skills. So when you're interviewing for it, what's what's that like? What are you talking about yourself? You know, it, it is. It's obviously a different job. There, there are different, um, you know, sort of guardrails in place. It's it's a whole different approach. Um, I feel very lucky that throughout my career, I've been able to um, do some criticism. Uh, you know, at, at the Times, uh, I was the second string fashion critic, um, not the chief, but uh, you know, I would I would do fashion criticism for both men's and women's fashion. Uh, I had started that even before uh, when I worked Condé Nast for a website called Style.com. I was one of the the runway critics there. So I've done some some book reviewing throughout my career. I actually started out reviewing restaurants at the very 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 beginning, and in, in the good old days of of, um, paper magazine. Oh, cool! Uh, for Great. Julie Bezanin, uh, you know, a legend in, in downtown yeah. uh, restauranting. So uh, it's always been an interest of mine. It's always been something that um, I, I've been glad to do. If anybody is glad to let me, um, you know, it, it was certainly a big pivot from what I was doing at New York Magazine, and and you know, it, it was a slightly different interview process. I suspect because I I came from within the magazine, um, and so they were very familiar with me. They were very familiar with my work um, and how I work, which I think is, is maybe as important as the work I was doing itself. Um, this pivot, I I have to admit, uh, maybe I shouldn't, but I will. Came as a total surprise to me. Um, you know, obviously, I was I was aware that Adam Platt had kind of taken a step yeah. back after twenty five years. Twenty two, okay. I think. I'm drowning but, up, but... but I, but yes, I, I, I think we can give him the the full. We'll 25. give him the full uh, quarter, quarter century. Let's, let's give it to him. Uh, you know, in, an incredible critic, a, a beautiful writer, yeah. um, a, a really interesting and generous thinker on food, and and a, and a really wonderful colleague. I have to say, you know, whenever I've dipped my toe in the water of of food uh, reportage or, or feature writing, which I I sort of realized in applying for this job, I I had I had been doing pretty regularly, um, because of just my own interest in it. Uh, 
always incredibly giving and generous with with his time and his insight and and all the rest. Uh, but he he had stepped back, and you know they they had uh, they were trying out this uh, Year 8 New York feature. Uh, yeah. It was kind of a time of transition. And um, it never would have occurred to me to throw my hat in the ring, um, not because I wouldn't kill for the job, just because, uh, you know, it, it seemed like a kind of brass ring too far. And, uh, you know, I know that they they were looking for a long time. I don't really know what the contours of that, of yeah. that were, but I know that at a certain point... Um, Alex Young, my colleague Alex Young, who was doing, uh, just fin- wrapped up doing the Year 8 New York, uh, somewhere in the midst of it, he was closing a big feature, and he didn't have the the bandwidth to do the column that Oh, week. so you're like, I'm going to jump in and do it. Uh, they they extremely kindly asked me oh, to jump okay. in and do it. I, I don't know why exactly. Huh. Um, I don't know if they felt I was, you know, sort of uh, dragging along without without a feature in some time or, or something yeah. like that, or, or that I'd be good at it or whatever. But they they just kind of lobbed to me. You know, this is this is open. Would you like to basically? Would you like to have a free dinner? Would you like to have a free dinner yeah. and write about it? Um, you know, I I knew the food team. I you know, as I said, I'd written a number of features about food, so I don't a, a beautiful Keith McNally profile in twenty twenty one. You actually interview the guy, which is a real. Uh, we'll get to we'll get to Keith uh, at some point. <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yes. I, well, interviewed is is a is uh, you know in quotes with Keith, but yes. yeah. Um, so I don't I don't think I was totally out of left field, but but they had um, they'd asked me to do that, and I. Uh, I wrote a column on uh, a restaurant that I thought was sort of a, a very funny and in some ways sort of dispiriting concept, this uh, Centurion restaurant, which is the restaurant that is more or less exclusively for um, Amex black card mm-hmm. holders. Uh, you, technically, I think legally it is not exclusively exclusively yeah, for it. But it's for be. the black uh, black card holders. It's, yeah, it's a certain vibe. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, it's it's at the top of this, you know, kind of uh, mm-hmm. Dixon swinging skyscraper and and it's um, Danielle Ballou's group is is the one that, that uh, you know, d- does all the food. And um, I, I, I sort of talked my way in. Um, it was a funny story, which I ended up relating in the review. I, I had gone to um, a benefit lunch honoring uh, someone that I'd used as a source in a piece, and I ended up sitting next to an extremely fancy uh, plastic surgeon, and we were talking, and at the time I was really interested in the idea of the power lunch. Yeah. And uh, he said, you know, well, the, the, for the power lunch, you have to go to the Centurion Club. And I said, well, great, like, you know, can I borrow your Centurion card? Yeah, my my application uh, has, uh, been, has been lost make, in the mail, yeah. and uh, you know he he introduced me to some people. We did some calls. We did some feather smoothing. We we did all sorts of stuff, and and they let me in, and I had a meal that I, I have to say was. Uh, a, a little bit to my surprise was was a great meal. I mean, so that guy. I, th- I'll link to this article. And I, I recall it vividly, and and this is like your entry into food writing, at least at New York Magazine, as a possible critic. Um, by the way, power lunching. I think it's like between Sweet Green and the Mon is where it's like somewhere between those two <laughs> those two poles. I feel in our town, it's a, a very interesting. I would love to read you on it. Okay, so let's get into the job itself. How do you? decide um, where the review is going to land each week? Do you work with editors? Are you just like instinctually checking stuff out? In terms of what um, what restaurants? Yeah, work? like which ones, like your kind of your lineup. Um, how does that determine? I, I'm super lucky. I work um, very closely with Alan Sitzma, who's the food editor of yeah. the magazine and, and runs Grub Street and, um, and and really the whole the whole Grub Street team. I mean, it's it's a it's a small team within the magazine, um, but I, I think in, incredible uh, store of talent. I mean, Oh, yeah. Tammy Dick and, and, and Chris Crawley have been on the show. Yeah. Good. Absolutely. Zach Schiffman, who does all our social and, and you know, all that. I mean, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I'm, I'm maybe forgetting someone, but I, if, if so, I yeah, apologize. I um, I, I think those are, those are the, the main heavies, at least. And, uh, you know, it, it's finding a sort of path for this particular column, you know, uh, for, for the first six months, Alex was still also doing your eight in New York. So we had, you know, basically three full-time critics. We now, you know, have two full-time critics, but, but even that it's sort of like, well, what is a Tammy review versus a me review versus a your eight New York review, um, or your eight New York assessment, whatever you call it. And, um, you know, the, the thing that guides me, I think is really what's newsy because I I do come from a news background and I do you know I, yeah. I want there to be a sense of uh, newness and and uh, immediacy to the column and what people are talking about or what people aren't talking about that I think there's every reason they should be talking about 
you know, obviously it's very important to me, it's very important to the magazine that there be a diversity of geography, that there be a diversity of price range, that there be a diversity of cuisine, um, you know, and, and so that's a lot of different kind of dials to have oh to my gosh. with. It's got to be the remit it's, is kind of impossible because your your readership is also national. Like I feel of New York Mag, a review that hits is like your LA is reading you as much as New York in some ways because there's a lot of business being done in both cities. It seems <laughs> then you're, with that, it's like, do you go to D Brooklyn? Right. <laughs> well, I, it's completely true. And, and New York really is a national magazine. Yeah. But I think one of the things that I, I really respect about it is that I think the magazine has been able to kind of thread this difficult needle of being um, a national magazine with a really specific uh, local focus. Yeah. And especially for things like, you know, the dining reviews, to me, it's so important that they are useful. Um, and that doesn't specifically mean or it doesn't exclusively mean, you know, that you have to be able to get on the L train and go to Bushwick to, you know, eat ceviche or, or whatever it may be, but that it is useful as a reading experience and it is something that is sort of practical and practicable if you are local enough to, to take it. And also it. a nice piece of criticism. And I, and I love that way you set up your career by you worked runway, you're a critic in runway, you were a critic in, uh, in, in retail um, and wrote book reviews. I mean, really, it has to be a story too. It can't just be a list of things that are good or bad. Completely. I mean, you know, not not just reviews, but all journalism sure. or, or most of journalism, essentially, you know, that you you sort of labor under the weight of knowing that you're tomorrow's fish wrap. Like this stuff just doesn't it is built to be consumed and disposed. Um, and and I think that's really challenging. I, I struggle with that a lot. But I also read a lot of old journalism, whether for for research or for pleasure, or whatever else. And and you know, you can read a a food review by by Ruth Reichel or Sam Sifton or Pete or Hannah Goldfield or, or you know any of the million people who do this stuff um, from five or ten or fifty years ago with enormous pleasure and get um, a real glimpse into the life of the city, and so the true, life of the culture at the time, and and that's that's obviously extremely high bar, and I, I'm sure I don't I don't clear it week after week, but the the goal is to you know be able to to split the difference between something that is useful now and that will tell a story yeah. about that, an era because it's time stamped and that's, that's a cool thing i mean i i think you're, no one none of those guys hit it every week did you read any rw apple johnny apple from the new york times sure 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 that I mean, guy is interesting his his work I, there are so many great food writers and food critics that i think don't necessarily get the uh the, the same adulation that the critics in different disciplines yeah. get, you know, everybody uh, agrees that that Pauline Kael is a secular saint. But uh, as far yeah. as I'm concerned, Gail Green is every bit at that level, um, you know, and, and food writing generally. I mean, there's such a rich trove of MFK Fisher and, uh, you know, the Blue Trout and Black Truffles. There's there's mm -hmm. so much great writing. Apple, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know Trillin. I mean Trillin is is yeah. Like, I've yeah. tried to get Trillin on the show. I, I know his health is 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 not is not amazing, so I've I've tried to do that. But yeah, Trillin is somebody we should be talking about for sure. You know, so it, it's as far as I'm concerned. You know, this this is sort of um, skipping in the the footsteps of giants. Yeah, and, and then uh, down the hatch, of course, Robert Sitsuma. Sure, can't forget Abs about that. Absolutely. I've asked you know Hannah Goldfield, Pete Wells, Ryan Sutton, Bill Addison, Ruth Royal, many other critics. I love speaking with you because such a cool job about this crushing deadline, because it really is. I mean, we we got to like recognize it for our listeners that um, this job is very difficult. You're writing on deadline weekly. What's it like for you right now, six months in? You know, I, I think there's probably not a, a writer alive uh, who doesn't complain about deadlines pretty <laughs> constantly. Um, you know, that said, I think deadlines can be enormously helpful. Oh, they're um, essential. I think we are all... Uh, perfectionist pains in the asses and and the thing would never come out if it uh you know what's the Tina Fey line uh, you know Saturday Night Live doesn't go on because it's ready it goes on because it's 11:30 yeah right uh, yep. and it's very that i mean as as someone who started my my media career um in sort of the blog trenches as as many people um my age did you know to me to have a weekly deadline versus a four blog posts a day or six blog posts a day deadline feels luxurious, um, you know, and and even when I was at the Times, you know, we were generally trying to hit, um, you know, 
we had two feature sections, two style sections a week, a, a Thursday and a Sunday, and you generally wanted to at least have something to offer for each of them. They and then plus covering them. the shows, which takes you out of, out of the game a little bit too, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and covering the shows, I mean, when I was reviewing shows, I used to write six show reviews a night. I mean, I, we would stay up till four o'clock in the morning I'm reviewing. thinking, Matthew, this is maybe why they hired you. <laughs> They're like, you like you, you hinted at it when you said they knew your work and knew your style. Um, it hasn't and, killed me yet. Well, yeah, but you love what you do and you get it done. And I mean, same can be said for Tammy and Chris as well, two people I, I highly admire. And I think New York Mag, um, I like the LA Times right now, their, their city section. I think New York Mag is running a terrific city section, really just strong work right now. And the deadline is 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 obviously something you can handle. Um, let me ask you about your eating schedule. I think, uh, you know, how are you booking your calendar? Are you able to get it all done? Like, I feel like that's the biggest challenge is like the scheduling of your life. It's tricky. And and as you know, many critics I know have told you before, it it's often extremely last minute and panicked. And, you know, I, I'm constantly texting friends and saying, you know, are you free for uh, empanadas in two hours? Yes. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I should probably be more organized about it than I am. I have a running uh, spreadsheet that I keep sort of mostly updated. I have about 200, you know, resi notifies on at all time, even though I have sort of complicated feelings about, um, the, the sort of biases I think that that imports. So yeah. I, I'm trying to actually sort of uh, decouple myself from that Can a little bit. Can you write about that? I would love to read an essay. I know that you have time, but like about like quitting Resi. I can't. I love the restaurants, but I I feel it. I feel you. There's something existential that I don't like about going to Resi to plan my meal. That That's kind of fucked in my opinion. It's... I, I haven't sort of really sat down and sorted through my feelings about it enough to to say anything definitively at the moment. But but I do feel very keenly that, you know, this is a service that restaurants are paying for and paying a lot for. And it's, I think, challenging to, to many of the yeah. smaller ones. And I think the feeling is now, at least as it sort of bubbles up to me, that that you know, you you kind of can't do without it. Or if it's not Resi, that's open table or another one. And yeah. and, you know, one thing I want to be really aware of as a critic is not, you know, kind of privileging those restaurants that can afford to lay out that money every every month yeah. every year whatever the subscription is um you know i i recently wrote a bread restaurant called um Yulali, and one thing i really liked about it was that it refuses to participate in any of that uh you know i i think that makes certain people kind of tear their hair out because you have to have a number of phone calls about it and people younger than i do seem to hate phone calls but uh I actually thought that was really charming and it was and- such a great beat in that article. The the the, the booking of that Yulali was a restaurant I had not known about. Um, and God bless you for doing it. I hope you can do more of like the Yulalis of the world. I think that's that's real service journalism is to bring if it's good. Bring people to them. It doesn't have to be part of Resi. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be, you know, Yulali, which is a tasting menu for a hundred and some dollars a thing. You know, yeah. it can be a hole in the wall. It can be, it can you know, be. a place just, just starting out. Um you know, I think that's important. So in terms of how I organize the weeks, you know, it's pretty well known to us. I'm sure it's pretty well known to you. There, there's a big, um, you know, sort of press apparatus dedicated to getting out the word about the restaurants they can afford to participate in that. So we're very well aware that, you know, there's a new Jean-Georges, there's, you know, a new this, a new that. And and I think it's important, you know, in, in terms of reader service to you know, visit the ones that people are going to be talking about. I, I try very hard to balance that with uh, places that that are not, you know, so known about it, whether that's sort of boots on the ground, whether that's talking to locals. Um, I, I wish I was doing a better job of that. I think that's a real area I would like to continue improving in. That's something I really respect about Tammy, about Chris, about yeah. Hannah. You know, all these people really, really are doing the kind of like shoe leather uh, kind of reporting. It really is reporting. Um that hasn't completely characterized my my beat yet in a way that I would like it to. Yeah. It, and it's not just the John Georges of the world. Like there's a new, um, you know, from uh, Domica, that group is mm-hmm. doing a new restaurant. So the, and the word gets out. Like I think it's like all types of restaurants have an apparatus, you know, like if they've had any success um, and they can afford PR, it's going to always inform uh, that like reach out to you and and all food writers. I, I think it's really hard to operate without that at this point, but that's all the more reason why I want to try to do a better job of being aware that there are great places that j- simply don't yeah. have the the wherewithal or aren't interested. You know. I yeah. Mean, I think you and I agree that. 
PR is not evil or it, it's a necessary part of the job, but it's not going to inform all of our decisions as editors and writers. Completely. I am you know, my, my beloved little sister is a publicist, yeah. uh, not, not in the restaurant world, but right. you know, she will, she will kill me if I, if I, of the course. headline and this is PR is evil, but P- PR is doing a service and it's Absolutely. a service we're paying for it and whatever it's, it is truly the job of, of journalists, um, of whatever stripe, I think to take in as much information as possible yeah. and make a decision that benefits not the PR and not the restaurant or not the profile subject or whatever the case may be, but the reader. And that, Super that's fair. What I try to keep in mind. A couple of general, more general questions that we'll get into in some New York, New York stuff, um, specifics. How do you make an exciting review for a boring restaurant? Do you regret any reviews yet six months in? I kind of think I don't. I, maybe that's uh, that's hubris talking. And, no, it's and, not. Uh, whatever. But I, I actually, you know, you you had um, you, you'd asked me this in, in an email, and and I was going back through, and I thought like, do I? Because I've I've written some some tough reviews. I I to me they always seem um, I hope sprightly and and you know credit where credit is due and and uh, enjoyable. But uh, you know certainly I I have had some some difficult opinions to share and uh you know to to my mind those are th- those are what people are in it for but uh no I don't I don't think there's anything I would completely you know walk back or Good. maybe I, I I'd expect not I mean I, I you're being honest I I, I think 6 months you you really you have a measured approach you you write what you feel and it's it's a place in time and maybe if things get better it'll it'll, it'll you'll revisit but like I feel like a restaurant review has to be confident right you can't like back track on it this this isn't a job for milk toast this is yeah. this is you have to be brave and you have to you know we, we were just saying before we started recording that uh you know i, I published this review today um of the jean George place which i think is is in some ways sort of an homage to the four seasons and and an attempt to homage plant that is not season. the word used in the headline well uh, you know as you know uh, i don't write the headline as i do know and let's point out to anyone who's writing matthew any any DMs? Uh, you know what? He doesn't. He doesn't write those headlines. Uh, I stand by the headline, but I, I, yeah. I do not think I wrote that one. But um, you know, and and uh, the the good folks at the grill seem to have been uh, a little a little salty about it, and yeah. and that's fine. I, you know, I welcome that, and and I I understand that, and I respect it, and and I kind of like it. I, I would like to you know have opinions that are worth uh, either agreeing with strongly or disagreeing with. Strong Have you had any other exchanges with with chefs or or, or operators to, for your reviews? Not really. I my experience has been that um, chefs and restaurateurs are very respectful of of the kind of. Um, moat between yeah. critics and restaurateurs. I, I have sort of heard through the rumor mill that there are some that have been displeased with this, that, or the other, but it, it really hasn't come to me, um, which is honestly one of the bigger changes from when I was uh, you know, doing doing more sort of investigative reporting and, and feature reporting. Um, you know, I, I've been in many arguments with with lawyers, with handlers, with minors. I've been threatened. I've been threatened bodily. I've been threatened legally. Like, you know, and uh, the first yeah. few times you got to build up thick skin to that. And and now I just think like, sure, like, let's let's talk about it. I'm, uh, I'm happy. I mean, Matt, to engage you, with you, on you that. cover fashion and like, not for me that that culture. I mean, I love the industry, the the the, the dedication, like a restaurant. But man, the people in fashion are are quite tricky, and it it seems like maybe the food world is a little more embracing. This is me reading it as a very biased food person and not a fashion person. Yeah, you know, I think fashion people get a bad reputation. Um, Sorry, I, I think that's okay. I, I have I have certainly said it many times myself. Uh, you know, I think both in fashion and in food, I have been lucky in some ways to be sort of half an outsider. Um, yeah. I don't have a background in fashion. I didn't go to fashion school. Uh, you know, I approached fashion as a reporter and and as a multi-billion dollar business that was worth scrutiny and and um, serious coverage. And and I feel the same about, uh, about the food world and the restaurant world. Maybe not billions in all cases, but... Oh, I mean, restaurant in in America, billions. Well, all right. I mean, trillions if you consider the grocery industry too, which is adjacent. Sure. I mean, it's much larger than fashion in the grocery industry. Oh, yeah. I just mean on an individual level. I don't don't know how many restaurants I review are. are, Oh, your uh, your remit. Plugging sales in in the billions. Of course. But um, you're you're reviewing, you know, Parenza Schuller. It's much different. Yes. Uh, John George, okay. you know, Prince of Sugar. Here we, here oh, we go. The, re- the reference has come out. I, I took the interview magazine at a test, like in 1999, and and failed miserably when they asked me 150 designers. I, I'm sure you might know about the edit test. It's pretty legendary. But I mean, 
I, I think I feel embraced by the food world. I, I Because I think there is such a need for a critic to stay as much as possible above the fray and to not, you know, get too cozy with the people he's covering or she's covering. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't totally know. The, the thing that I find really heartening, and, and I, I think that's may now be the third and hopefully last time I say this, but I, the response from readers has been really great. And and I do think, to me, that is what, what it's there for. I, I have the utmost, utmost respect for chefs and restaurateurs and anybody who is brave enough and foolish enough and quixotic enough to dedicate themselves to this. Um, and I really write about this stuff because I love it. I, I yeah. you know, applied for this job because I love it. Uh, I hope I got this job because I love it. I want to be super clear about that, even, you know, in cases where um, I may, you know, give a negative review or, or have, you know, certain things to say. I, I had come to this with from such a place of, you know, respect and adoration. I mean, I was essentially raised in restaurants, not because uh, my my family worked in restaurants, which is a different way to be raised in restaurants. I was raised in restaurants because, uh, and I've said this before, uh, my parents couldn't cook mm. and I was raised in New York City. And yeah. so basically from diapers onward, we were eating in restaurants and they, and they weren't, you know, the Four Seasons of Jean Georges or anything yeah. like that. They were the local Chinese place and they were, you know... My my kind of Proustian Madeleine restaurant is uh, Hamburger Harry's, which oh, used yeah. to be on Chambers Street. Uh, you know, you grew up in Tribeca downtown. I did. I yeah. was born in Chelsea, grew up in in Tribeca, sort yeah. of just in the kind of like weird interstitial period between like Griffin Dunn after hours Tribeca and you You're know born Citigroup for this Tribeca. job, buddy. I, I mean, I mean that with all respect. I think this the 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 institution that you write for, um, the fibers of the writing there is for people who are f living here, from here. Obviously, outsiders write from New York Bank all the time, but man, you're born for that job. It's cool. Well, thank you. I, I certainly hope so. All right, so let's talk about some some actually some some food stuff. We've got. This, I wanted the broad like career questions, and you were a good sport about that. But I had Tammy in about a year ago, and Tammy, you're coming back soon. We've been texting about that. Um, Rock Center, Rock Center. I had I had a long conversation with her, and is it working? Is the restaurant um, kind of strategy there working? That's a great question that you would have to ask someone who is more sort of in the reporter trenches than I am. I mean, is it working from a business standpoint is one question. Is it working from a, a food standpoint? Yeah, I, I should the be answering. The number two uh, is what I totally meant to. Yeah. That is exactly the right way to respond to that question. I honestly, because there is so much for me to catch up on um, and the preference is for reviews of um, of places that are, are more newly opened, uh, I've eaten at a number of the Rock Center restaurants. I haven't eaten every one. Yeah. I haven't gone to them enough to say, you know, these are great or not great. Um, in my limited and so anecdotal experience, I think sort of mileage varies based on on which one. I think the bigger question, and it's a really interesting question, I think it's really the right question for right now, it comes up all the time, is what do we think about this sort of mutually beneficial relationship between kind of real estate developers and restaurateurs. Um, you know, it came up again in the the 425 review that I published today. You know, 425 is in this new um, highly developed skyscraper. East 56, 57th around there, right? Uh, in fact, and, you know, you will know exactly where it is because it is at 425 Park Avenue. The, yeah. the name of the restaurant itself is an advertisement for the leasing office. Uh, and that's not an accident, you know, Um how do we feel about that? You know, there, there's always been uh, a relationship between restaurateurs and their landlords. Great question. I mean, I'll interject and say like the utter failure of Hudson Yards and the restaurants there. Of course, the pandemic had a lot to do with it. So it's not fully grading. It's a little bit grading on a curve. But I think that there's definitely were some really interesting to, to disgraceful concepts opened in Hudson Yards. I think uh, Rock Center seems to be working. Like I wasn't trying to lead you in any mm -hmm. direction. But personally, I think the way that it's brought excitement to Midtown, um, and I think the concepts there uh, are diverse from a, a, a wide swath of New York City restaurants. And I, I, I see tourists really being excited by places like, you know, Naro gets mentioned quite a bit, mm -hmm. but you've got um, Jupiter has definitely gotten better over time. You know, there's definitely um, concepts. Eli Sussman's in the food hall there is, is Samesa's is, is crushing. Of course, uh, J.J. Johnson's uh, rice restaurant um, is is tremendous and a beard semifinalist. So anyways, that's my take. <laughs> I, I need to do a, a fuller kind of tour of, of the whole scene. Um, 
you know, my experience lately has mostly been limited to the fact that my dentist is around the corner. Yeah. And so I always... Uh, a great reason to visit Midtown. I Well, you know, it's I, I do the thing that you absolutely shouldn't do, which is I get my teeth cleaned and then I end up at Lodi getting some $9 pastry to reward <laughs> myself and absolutely undo all of the progress I've just made. Uh, <laughs> But yes, I mean, I think I'm really interested in the relationship between real estate and restaurants. And there is a diversity of food in in um, Rock Center, but there also is a real bias toward the expensive and and kind of the shiny. And, you know, should that be the case, uh, you know, in Rock Center, maybe, but in the city full stop, I think a- absolutely not. Uh, and so, you know, you, you do accidentally or or inevitably import a lot of uh bigger thornier questions once once you start talking mm-hmm. about this stuff and and I hope to continue talking about it. Uh, related my I get my annual physical and, and my cholesterol check on uh, on 32nd Street in Korea and I always go and get solentong, like the most like cholesterol laden dish in the Korean canon, you know. You got to do it after a medical exam. That's what the statin's working for. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I'm on 10 mmg. I don't know who you are, but you know. We're not going to get personal. All right, let's talk about Keith McNally. We're going to be entering the Keith McNally press blitz with his memoir coming out he's he's very active on socials which uh you know mileage may vary uh on what you think about keith with those socials it's it's highly entertaining to some okay so keith you've written this profile about keith and and really let me ask you um, about keith do you feel keith mcnally we should be talking about him or should we just like stop now and move on Uh, I think it depends if we have something new to say. I, I think at the time that I wrote that profile, uh, he had more recently emerged as a kind of lovable or not so lovable, as you say, depending on your point of view, Instagram troll. Uh, and I think it was notable. I, you know, I wasn't aware of other restaurateurs who had sort of taken it upon themselves to to leap into the fray in, in the way that he did. Um, and you know, there were reasons for that. I think, you know, I, I do genuinely think that some of those reasons are medical. Um, that is sort of Keith and and many of the people in Keith's orbit kind of said, you know, I had a massive stroke. And, you know, I think that operates in two ways. I think one of the ways it operates is that uh, you realize life is short and maybe you say, fuck it, I'm going to say what I want to say. And the other way is maybe it affects the part of your brain that, uh, you know, uses uh, releases you a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think at a certain point that starts to fade as a good reason. I think, you know, at a certain point, as happens to many people, uh, you know, who get very involved in in social media primarily, but also just kind of like public opining in general, you know, you get addicted to the attention and it becomes a, a feedback loop, whether whether that's a, a sort of virtuous cycle or a, or a non-virtuous cycle. You know, again, it's up to the listener. I have a lot of respect for Keith because I think he is still going at a time where it would be quite easy for him to stop. Love that response. I, I think we should keep uh, talking about him with that context. It's really well said, Matthew. And growing up in, in lower Manhattan, you obviously have to recognize Odeon, Pastis. You even have to recognize Schiller's. I mean, uh, the, the the Keith McNally uh, restaurant is part of our culture. Um, and Balthazar. Are you, are you going to revisit Balthazar as a critic of New York Magazine? I don't know if I will revisit it as as the critic. I will tell you that I revisited it about three weeks ago as someone who was leaving. Um, what were we leaving? I think we were leaving a play in the theater district or something, and it was eleven o'clock, and we were starving. And you know, there was there aren't as many yeah. options as you know New York would would have you believe there are. And we went down there, and uh, we we so we talked our way into a table. And we had, I would say, you know, a, a very good meal. You know, are there better French meals in New York to be had? I, I think absolutely there are. I said so quite openly in that McNally piece before I was even a critic. But sometimes you want the ambiance and the theater of it and the vibe and the practicality and the ease and and the feeling that somehow he is able to still conjure when you're there. You write about the La Le and Lu restaurants, uh, and you make this great turn of phrase. It's just masterful. It's from French to Frenchette, which I think everyone who knows New York kind of gets the sense of of this of this shift. And I want to ask you, like critically, should we be caring about these old guard French restaurants? It feels like the body is maybe warm and cooling. But on the flip side, you are of deep respect for New York as an institution. Uh, or as a place with institutions, and you write from New York Magazine, so it's part of your brand to write about these places. How do you negotiate the dying Lulu and La restaurant, which I think is great? 
I don't feel that it's my role necessarily to advocate for, you know, either putting the nail in the coffin or reviving the corpse. You know, I, I'm a bystander, you know, a, a, a hungry bystander, but but a bystander really all the same. What I think is important not to forget is the restaurant is a real important part of New York cultural history. Um, I, I think these restaurants, all restaurants really, uh, are, are really about what we aspire to and how we want to define ourselves and and how we wish we were as much as how we actually are. And I think unlike other forms of culture, you know, like movies that can play in repertory or plays that can be revived, uh, restaurants are ephemeral. You know, you you can bring back a restaurant, but it's not it's not really ever going to be the same twice. And so I think restaurants are very prone to being forgotten. Um, I think there are, you know, many, many people walking around the city who don't know anything about uh, Lutes or Le Caravel or Le Cote Basque or, or, you know, any of these places. I, I don't think that these places deserve to live forever. I think, you know, times change and tastes change. And, uh, you know, I also think it's important to to recognize when these places, you know, import their own biases and prejudices and and crowd out other places and and you know, give the idea intentionally or not that, you know, this is the only way to eat well or this is the only definition of fine dining. I think it's never been clear that that's not the case. That said, you know, for a certain type of person of the mid-century who was in, you know, a power player in New York who who was important to the life of the city and the business of the city, uh, these places were important. And so I what I don't want is for them to kind of go gently into the good night. I, I think, you know, being aware of them and and knowing about them and seeing how that uh, history kind of changes and mutates as we all evolve is fascinating. Um and and so that that's sort of my interest in uh in in remembering them. It's it's sort of thinking about where we've been and where we're now and where we're going less than I think, you know, it, it's a crime against humanity that that Lutes is closed, you know. Yeah, that Lutece you never closed. write with that hyperbole and I think the death by a thousand cuts for some of these restaurants it makes for good copy, but I really respect you zooming out and not taking the bait from my kind of weird question. <laughs> I don't think and, so at all. And and really you 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 had a real reporter's um response which I think is great and the, these are personally um not as a reporter just as somebody you know, with a microphone in his face. I think that you should definitely be writing about the death of some of these restaurants because they are important to the fabric but also writing about the death of of, of like restaurants like in, in like sixth street in 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 like little india like those, there's restaurants dying downtown in the east village more than than in midtown so i just hope that you and chris and T- tammy and the team looks at some of the dying restaurants and and gives them the the the, the credit they deserve and the honor you know i i am sure i'm not supposed to say too much about this uh but we are Looking at a project that I think will uh, will do some of that, and and hope to do some of that, and and that's one of the things that I'm most Love excited that. about for this year. Wonderful. Let's pivot to pizza. We just finished our pizza week here on Taste, and I feel you have a lot of thoughts. You had a great double review. Um, the industry, the the new West Village spot, and and Bar Birba. I thought that it was a really cool double review. And I guess my question generally is, is pizza in New York as good as it's ever been? Are you seeing any trends? Are you feeling like there's there's something happening here? Or is it on the flip, always been good and it's kind of just the way it is? Boy, this is like a dangerous question. This this is where, where people get killed, right? Um, <laughs> I think, and I have not done like the real kind of New York pizza survey I would like to yet. Um I think pizza is not as much a focus as it has been during certain other parts of my life in New York. You know, I, I was sort of recently returned to to New York um, from college when Franny's, the original Franny's, was uh, getting off the ground, and it was like you couldn't you couldn't have a conversation that wasn't somehow about pizza, and. You know, or or when I mean, Lucali is still impossible to get into. But there was a moment where you know Jay Z and Beyonce went to Lucali, and it was all anybody wanted to talk about. And um, I I think there is absolutely tremendous pizza in New York. I think New York is a great pizza city. I think the other cities that want to fight New York for that uh, you know honor are Los Angeles. I mean, it's just insane in my estimation. But uh, yeah, <laughs> there there I go. I. I think I think there is really good pizza in New York. I don't find that at the moment New York. I don't think that that is the sort of top of mind conversation. That said, you know, people are still opening pizza places. You know, Landry is is 
you know, I, I I had gone to London Street for lunch, but uh, I walked by, I happened to be walking by at like eight or nine o'clock in the evening the other night, and there was a line all the way down the block. Um, and there's there's great pizza from places that are that are still chugging along. For for my money, there's not better pizza in New York than uh, F and F. Oh, me in too. That's my number one. I've I've gone on record. Uh, well, L and B is my number one deep in Brooklyn, but my number one nouveau is is F and F. There's no better pizza. Thank uh, you, you know, I, I wish I had a more controversial take than that, but it's. It, I mean, F and F is definitely being forgotten. I'm just saying, people in Carroll Gardens know, and I used to live in that neighborhood, but like, it's not like on the radar of anyone. Is that right? Because whenever I try to get takeout, <laughs> they're like, absolutely not. Are you kidding? interesting? I, I I haven't lived in there in a while. I mean, I haven't been back in six months, but I feel there's like definitely industry, and there's other places that get a little more press but you know that's 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 why pizza is so great so let me flip it back to you then if pizza is maybe a little less interesting which is what i'm reading it's you're not saying that but that's what i'm getting a, a sense what is interesting is there a category matthew that you're you're really excited about you have like a notes memo with like a list of restaurants in that category that excites you yeah i mean i think the thing that's nice about new york and also challenging about new york especially for someone in my role is that it's usually six things at once um you know, it is beyond clear that that we're in a sort of uh, Korean food revolution moment. Um, there is so much good Korean food of of so many different um, stripes and and subregionalities. And and I mean, I, I don't need to tell you. I, I know who I'm talking to here. Hmm. But uh, you know, and and Alex uh, Young has done a, a terrific job. Um, cataloging a lot of that. Uh, you know, I haven't really written that much about Korean food yet. Maybe not. A, no, I did a little thing, but not much about yeah. Korean food, uh, in part because you know he he just lapped me to to so many of these places that that it opened before I took the job. Alex uh, made children go like kind of. I was just there this week, and I got there at five for a meeting, and it was filled by five ten, filled by five ten, and and deservedly so. I mean, there there's you know the the, the various groups. I mean, hand hospitality, but the Kim's all, all these people. I mean, are, are doing phenomenal work, and and really you know creating. Uh, I don't want to say creating, really introducing people, you know, to to a cuisine that I think has always certainly existed in, you know, on 32nd Street. And, and you know, if you want to go deeper at Murray Hill in Queens, there's like unbelievable Korean. But I, many people in my kind of milieu and my cohort weren't weren't necessarily going to that. And, and I think that that's really changed. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot happening in Indian. I think there's a lot happening uh, in Filipino. You know, there, there's a lot happening in, um, you know, sort of all, all of the various Asian cuisines that, uh, you know, have always been here and have always had, uh, you know, kind of uh, avatars and exemplars, but uh, not necessarily been quite so top of mind yeah. as they are right now. And I, I think that's fascinating. I think that's great. And, and, um, and Thai, my God, you know. I had a long conversation with a chef about Thai cuisine. And just as briefly, I, I feel with immigration being such a, uh, with, with Thai immigration being being a big part of New York now, like the, the immigration is 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 massive from Thai, Thai diaspora ending up in New York. It's, it's right exactly on the money. The the Thai revolution is 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 arriving. Uh, you know, it, it takes no genius to say this, but... Um... You know what? What uh, I think his name is Max Widowa. I, I may be mispronouncing that. I apologize. Uh, is doing it at Bangkok Supper Club. It yeah, is uh, un- unbelievable. I mean, it, the food is so good and and so specific. And um, I, you know, I, I haven't actually reviewed it yet because we've covered it uh, in in a number of other ways. And uh, at, at this point, nobody needs me to tell them it's good because everybody knows. Yeah, but it is. So let me ask you about the art direction of the pages on the at least on the online versions. I feel there's been a real change with these animations, with these gifts, with these short short I would call them films, but they're not really films. Um, was that your doing? Because I feel like that's a really nice change for your reviews. There's some the UX to use a weird term is is beautiful for New York Mag right now. As much as I would like to, I can take absolutely zero credit for yeah. that. Okay. Um, that is, I, I believe that that was the the brainchild of David Haskell, our editor in chief. Yeah. Um, certainly, you know with. Alan Sitzma, the food editor, uh, they're done every week by Hugo Yu, who's, who's sort of our in-house photographer. Um, you may have a more proper title than that. I don't know. But uh, he is terrific. And, um, you know, I sometimes we accidentally overlap and, you know, kind of can't acknowledge each other. You put a little bit of a blur face on your... <laughs> I, you know, I, I said to Alan, actually, uh, <laughs> this one, you can't see me, but I, you can see someone that I was dining with. And I said, you know, just be careful if the photo selection changes. I, I really love it. I think it's a real, it's a trademark. Uh, New York Mag is, is just brilliant with, with trademarking and, 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 and really 
following through with the bit for a long time. So it's good. I, I think it looks really great. I'm I'm so pleased. I mean, I, you know, I, I know that I, I'm coming across as so in the tank for New York Magazine, but one of the many things I love about the magazine is that there is no facet of the work that they don't get super involved in. It's not, you know, this is a written piece and so the photo can be whatever, or this is a photo-driven essay. So, you know, the caption doesn't matter whether it's, you know, 50 words or 500 words or a 5,000 word feature. Like there, there is just no part of it that's sort of allowed to, um, to, to kind of drag along his dead. No, way. you read the magazine and every every page is considered. It's it's real. It's great work. I'm in the tank as well from New York Mag on the record. All right, we're gonna do two quick sections. You're gonna you're gonna this is gonna be fun. I, I know it's difficult, <laughs> but we're gonna just do it. We'll call these like a New York quick takes. Best slice right now. Uh, I I think I've already tipped my my yeah, hand, F but F. Um, F and F. Uh, I I will say that I I really enjoyed uh, this pizza that that uh, Tammy discovered Farina, which sort of weirdly wedged under the BQE. Um, not not exactly a slice joint, but I, I think they're doing great stuff too. But uh, you know, the slice for me is is got to be F and F at this point. Um, your favorite midtown lunch spot right now? Probably you know somewhere in the Sichuan corridor of 39th Street. Um, there there are a million places, some of which I go to regularly, some of which I don't. Um, but all all are kind of great. I I don't get there a ton anymore. I was I, when I was at the Times, I was much closer to to that part of the world. But there's one I wrote about recently that I think is out called uh, Peppercorn Station. Yes, where I, I know that. Lunch. Oh, that's that's ill. That's good. Good call. That was that was Good a nice call. one, and uh, you know that's that's one of the places where like the, you know the the quality of the food is is inversely proportional to the you know kind of height of the ceiling and and the you know terribleness of the lighting and and I don't care you know I'm just there shoving my face with you know crab guts and tofu. Best ice cream. It's February, but we can always talk about ice cream. I there ice cream is one of the things that I always have in my house. I love it. Uh, I, I am Same. I'm an ice cream guy. I make it sometimes, uh, not not all that much. But what is the best ice cream? I, the truth is, I'm I'm such a slut for ice cream that yeah. it, it sort of almost doesn't matter. Um, I I still love a Haagen Dazs. I live right by uh, the original Haagen Dazs scoop shop from the '70s. Uh, I think Blue Marble does great, great, great basics. Uh, you know, it, it it's a little sort of like dorm room stonery, but I, I will still. <laughs> Eat some of the Ample Hills flavors, uh, you know. And anytime I see a new a new something, I, j I just read the Barbara Streisand memoir, which is actually sort of like quietly a real food book. And, oh my god, uh, dude, we 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 messaged about that. It's like forty seven hours. Uh, it's forty seven hours, and I think forty six of them are about food on the audio on the audio book we're, we're referring to. And we we that's one of our books here. I I, I honestly oh, let's just do a whole episode about that food being a food book. Well, because it really is, and her ice cream choice is definitely a thread. Well, she she loves these McConnells, uh, Santa Barbara, ice Santa cream. Barbara, and and there you now can get them very easily nationally. There are a lot of supermarkets, uh, and so I've been saying that I need to do like a real McConnells deep dive. I never knew I would know so much about the film Yentl. I, I I literally the the film Yentl is now part of my body. Enjoy. I, I it's a I love Yentl. It's a great film. Okay, a few more. Let's talk about coffee. I feel like that is a micro theme here. Are you into yeah, it? Yeah, you're you're a real coffee guy, I think, right? I like writing about it tremendously. I, I enjoy all elements about it. Like as an editor and writer, I enjoy it more actually than I do drinking it, to be honest. So I I will sort of preface this by saying that I uh I need to have coffee every day. Uh, but in some ways I'm very, you know, prissy about it, and in some ways I'm not. I, I actually prefer drip coffee. I'm not much of an espresso person. I, I, you know, I certainly will have an espresso or, or a, you know, a cappuccino or whatever. But I, I really run on drip coffee that we make at home. Um, that's that's the sort of unpretentious part. <laughs> the, the pretentious part is that uh, I, I have tried, certainly not every coffee, but I, I have tried a number of of the fancy coffees. And the one that I really return to is uh, Parlor. Yeah. I, I just think they make an unbelievable coffee. I, I first had it at um, the the now departed uh, Tilda, my old neighbor of Clinton Hill. Uh, yeah. The guy, Danny Nussbaum, who who ran coffee there since passed away, uh, was was a real Parlor partisan. And and they're over there. They're, they're, um, they're right by the Navy Yard. And so we get the Prospect Blend in five pound bags. And it used to take us three months to go through them. And now it takes us sort of two months to two go months. through them. And we're I think we're cresting towards six weeks. And at which point I'm going to get sort of nervous for my my. I love it. Uh, your journey is your journey is, is I feel it's begun. 
We're 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 on the way, but You're that's that's the one. You know, I I for a minute I sort of dabbled with say coffee from Bushwick, which I think is very good, and uh, I, I live right by Drip, um, is in my subway station, that's and they my guy. they have Nigel a, Price, they have an I, an amazing selection. Uh, it's just it's uh, it's honestly it's like hard to afford. I mean that that coffee is expensive. Yeah, well, you know what? Good coffee costs a lot. That's that's right. Relatively you, speaking, but costs little. It's an affordable luxury. Listener, I know you've heard me say that a million times, but. Right, I mean, it's, it's absolutely true, and I, you know, I, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because I am the person who is now arguing for you know more and more expensive wine. So, wine hey, alcohol. well, I think they're both go hand in hand. All right, on this is taste. We ask guests about the discerning taste. So to close this interview, Matthew, here's a little rapid fire, fast and furious taste check. Are you ready? Okay. The best fruit. The best fruit. I think cherry. The worst vegetable. I honestly like don't care about beets. Yeah, I agree. Hard, hard agree. The best dessert. The dessert that I will not pass up on a menu is anything with chestnut. So there's a peri breath peri that does chestnut in there. Uh, no. the Mont Blanc, I think. Mont Blanc, yeah. which is I, which is sort of having a moment. That's I keep, the guy. They, they, yeah. they keep getting offered to me, and honestly, I take them every time. I it's, I I actually feel like, and now that I've announced it publicly, I probably have to stop. I know you're you're uh, going to be in trouble. I think the, um, her name is Han does an amazing Mont Blanc. Yeah, I, I just I don't know what it is. It it's one of those things that gives me sort of like warm memories of childhood. My my father <laughs> used to roast chestnuts in the oven, or maybe it was my mother who used to roast ch- somebody in my family used to roast chestnuts in the oven for Christmas, and uh, I I love that stuff. Is that the best dessert? I, I sort of think the best dessert is probably ice cream. But uh, I, it, I've got to give a shout out to my it, friend, the chestnut. A couple more. Your favorite city outside of America to visit for food? Uh, I would love to go back to Tokyo. I, I spent a weekend in Tokyo, which is a crazy amount of time to spend in Tokyo if you're yeah. coming from New York uh, and, and would love to go back there. I learned a lot of what I know about eating um, from being in Paris uh, for fashion, Milan in Paris, but but for food, even more Paris. And it's an unbelievable food city. Uh you know, outside of, of New York, I mean, they're great. I, you know, I've got to get back to the Bay Area um, in America. I've got to get back to LA. You know, there, there's a million places. But uh, unfortunately, New York Magazine does not seem that inclined to send me to, to all of them. They used to do that. that back in like the gravy days, they would probably send their critics out. And just, you know, they used to do that at the Times too. Wells used to review those r- r- other cities. I remember I was reading, I think it was Sifton wrote a piece about, you know, when he got the job and he was switching over from uh, like a culture editing gig or something. And and they they basically sent him on on kind of like a a rum spring abroad to just like <laughs> eat for six weeks. And I thought like, okay, like how do I That's like how going do I manage to space that? camp for all food writers. I mean, geez, getting to go abroad to study. Well Exactly. Well, you know, if if anybody wants to sponsor me, you know. Yeah, guys. All right. Last one. Your favorite sandwich. God, I, you know, it's like every sandwich is too good. The sandwich is such a perfect form. Um, I mean, there's nothing like a grilled cheese. Ooh. There's nothing like a BLT. Uh, there is nothing like a good egg sandwich. Uh, PB&J. I will say the sandwich that most surprised me by, you know, sort of singing to me with its siren song, um, I was at uh, s and not too long ago. and they do a cream cheese and olive sandwich. I knew you were going to say that. Oh my, I almost like put the words in your mouth. I, I've had that sandwich every time I've been there. I've been there four times. I, and I'm a little embarrassed that like I don't have, you know, I'm sure I should say, like Bar Beerba does like a mortadella and pistachio yeah. sandwich that's unbelievable. And like, of course, you know, and I should be saying, you know, this artisanal liverwurst sandwich and whatever and muffaletta and, and all of that is true. But I, I don't know, you know, when you when you get down to real superlatives, I think, you know, it all kind of comes back to what was in your lunchbox. Yeah. And, and for me, it was... You know, PB and J, a perfect turkey sandwich. Yeah, but. cream and cream cheese on bread is is so underrated. They do it overseas. They don't do it much in the states, which is crazy because cream cheese to me is such an American. Yeah, I know. Form the you bagel know. has like kind of stolen the stolen it. Well, you know, my hottest take is that I prefer a bialy to a bagel. That is such a take. <laughs> wow. So you're gonna have Mario Carbone after you. And then you're going to have like all of New York bagel makers. I love it, Matthew. This is going to be good. Just and I don't even it. have Mimi Sheridan still with us to defend. Me. I know Mimi is the best on Instagram or Twitter to, to defend. Matthew, what a pleasure talking to you. I hope you come back. Thank you so much for joining this taste. Thank you so much for having me. Eliza, we're here. We're smiling because when you smile, the listener actually can feel it. 
the energy is there, right? We're smiling. We have to come up with our like vocal smiling version. Vo- vocal smiling. It, it's a little late in the afternoon. We've both done some sessions. We're kind of dragging. But you know what, listener? We're doing this for you. We got three things. What's your first thing? My first thing, well, all three of my things are related to Los Angeles because I just went home this past weekend to see my family. So my first thing is a dish that I had at Spoon and Pork, a Filipino place at their west side location on Sautel. They call it patita. Pata is traditionally a deep fried pork trotter. And patita at Spoon and Pork is a pork shank that's been braised for 15 hours. Then they air dry it for a day and then they deep fry it. Ooh, ooh. That sounds amazing. I know my parents ordered it, which my parents do not cook pork in the home, would not really order this much pork going out. So I was kind of surprised that it's what they wanted, but they had had it before and they said it was so good that they needed me to try it. And it really was quite special. Oh, my God. I mean, I, let me I have a question about this. So when you have a deep fried pork trotter, is there like a condiment or sauce that kind of like does that like cut through, cut through the fat thing, you know, the acid cut through the fat? Yeah, definitely. It's kind of glazed in this sweet chili sauce that has I think it's dried garlic kind of all throughout it. Um, so you have this kind of like crispy lacquered pork skin and then just really beautiful kind of tendy, sh- tender, shreddy pork beneath it. I love it. You also said tendies. I, lo- I said tendies. You yeah. said tendies. I meant to say tender and shreddy and I said tendy and I hope no one would notice so. Speaking of faux pas and speaking of Filipino food, I was upstairs talking to a gentleman who works in our IT department about a pop-up window that won't go away. Uh, Boring story. But when I referred to the suite of products that help us design taste, I referred to um, it as the adobo suite of products. And I felt extremely like my mom um, because we do not use adobo products here at Penguin Random House. So if the adobo products are not your first thing, what is your first thing? (laughs) My first thing is also randomly LA related. We never share this together. This is the first time you're hearing it there's a great cookbook coming out from the kismet crew sarah kramer and sarah high mason do you know this restaurant have you been being an la native i have been to kismet and i think uh, natalie portman was sitting directly behind me when i went to kismet whoa 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 so That's that was a good spotting yeah you know it felt i felt appropriate i like kismet and i like they have the separate rotisserie place Oh, yeah, of course. That's um, Kismet um, Rotisserie. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's Sarah High Manson. I don't know why I I botched the name, but we're going to keep that in the edit. You know what? This book um, is we're putting it out, Clarkson Potter, and I've gotten a chance to take a look at the PDF. I haven't held the actual book. But anyone who knows Kismet knows this is a really interesting concept. It is blending this Middle Eastern Mediterranean cuisine with California. um, And they kind of put their stamp on it with dishes like salty sweet persimmon salad and a harissa party wing. They've got spice roasted tomatoes with grapefruit. Nice. I like that. And really, I think there's probably going to be a pretty banging chicken recipe given that they do kismet chicken. It's very veg centric. Um, Design is nice. This is a book that I'm really excited to kind of cook from this, this spring. Yeah, me too. You know, I'm a fan of what I call an opulent salad, and I think that's Mm -hmm. what Kismet does really well. So it'll be fun, especially for springtime. Completely. What's your second one? My second thing is that I went to an early dinner in K-Town when I was in LA. I went to Hungari Kalguksu. Have you been there before? I have not had Kalguksu there, but I love Kalguksu. It's one of my favorite soupy dishes. Yeah, and Hungari is kind of like a long time place in K-Town. I went at like 5 p.m. very early because my friend and I were hungry. And by the time we left at 6 30 on a weekend there was already quite a long line but my friend sally pointed out to me that they really have it down to science they take your order when you're in line so that by the time you sit down the food is ready for you so they're clearly like high volume this is one of the places to be i think that what i had that was my favorite thing was a clam kalguksu which was hand cut noodle soup it had squash in it and lots of clams and this kind of like light anchovy broth yeah. and it was really good it's a great broth. Um, Koguksu usually leans a little more towards the seafood side of things. When you have clams in it, it's very seafood forward, but you can have chicken in it sometimes too. But obviously the, the hand cut noodles or the dough flakes that you can make. We have a great recipe in our first book, Koreatown, for Koguksu. I love it. That's a, it's, it's actually really easy to make too. Pretty simple. Yeah, I would imagine. And I really want to go back to this place. What's yeah. your next thing? Hilariously, uh, another segue. We, again, did not share these, but I just got back from Korea. Um, and you'll hear my recap later this week um, as a B segment about all the places I visited. But I wanted to call out one place in particular while I was in Seoul. I got to go to Mom's Touch Lab. Mom's Touch. Have you heard about Mom's Touch? 
probably not in the way that you're talking about it. <laughs> it's a, a, a wonderful name. Um, it really is memorable. Mom's Touch is truly the best fried chicken in Korea that I've sampled. Wow. It is. Um, I'll say this. Here's my visit to Mom's Touch Lab. The chicken arrived in a in a bowl, in like a real bowl, not paper or plastic. It's a real bowl. Cartoonishly crunchy. Like scientifically um, engineered to be crunchy. Um, I loved it so much. I got to say the flavor wasn't like fully there, but like just the crunch factor was something I'd never really had in my life with fried chicken. It was really excellent. Do you have any theories as to why it's so good? Are they frying in a certain kind of oil or dredging in something special? It's definitely the way of the dredge and the way the craggly crust works. I believe they're using some kind of rice flour or some kind of like not to use chemical, but like some kind of agent that makes it kind of craggle up in a, in a unique way. I'm going to be exploring this in future writing for sure. Um, I have to say that the chicken sandwich wasn't bad either. Uh, the bun kind of disintegrated, but often in Korea, the, the baking is not not awesome in the like the sandwich bun variety. There's incredible baking in terms of like amazing pastries, as you'll hear on Wednesday. But really, I, I love um, the way this chicken crunches. Mm. Oh, it sounds great. They also do a burger and it was like hot trash. Um, and I certainly would not recommend eating a burger at Mom's Touch. But Mom's Touch Lab, check it out. What's your last one? My last one is my last LA restaurant, which is a Taiwanese place called Little Fatty that I went to in kind of Mar Vista area. They are attached to the bar Accomplice. And so they do really nice cocktail program. But um, honestly, I think the dessert was my favorite part. Well, we had a lot of good things. They do like chow fun noodles um, kind of rolled up and sliced with exo sauce. They do an orange chicken that's probably the orangiest orange chicken I've ever had. Like, Is that a good thing? Yeah, I really liked it. It had definitely like orange zest finished on it and just a lot of like real orange flavor, which is kind of fun. But the best thing was that they did um, homemade sesame balls mm. warm with taro ice cream for dessert. Oh, I love a taro ice cream. I love that. So it's called, what's the name again? Lil Remember? Fatty. Lil Fatty. I mean, so I love that this is, is a casual place, like show up Lil Fatty. Yeah, they have a, a place called Fatty Mart around the corner, uh. which is actually more casual and they do really cool pizzas they were doing like a chicken mole pizza when i was there they have a big refrigerated case both with things you can buy and things that they're making so that's kind of even the more casual one and then little fatty is kind of like more of a sit-down spot it's the restaurant was there a restaurant that you wanted to go to that you didn't get a chance to that you're like man i wish i would have gone and it's uh, very short visit, I know. Yeah, I feel always with LA, there are so many places mm -hmm. that I want to go to. I've been wanting to go to this place, Chainsaw, in Echo Park for a while, mostly for the pastries. They do kind of these really delicious looking pies and milkshakes and things like that out of what I think is a converted garage. It was like a pandemic pop-up that now yeah. has a more permanent place. So that was what I was hoping to do this time. But, you know, it's always nice to just like eat a lot of citrus. I'm happy. Yeah. Have you been to a good used book yet? Do you no. know about this place? It's like a, it's a used book pop-up store that is on the east side no i love that title though it's, it's cool. really really cool i've written about it for why is this, why is this interesting that newsletter and i'll link to the show notes it's a really it's a favorite of mine i don't know why it just popped in my head right. no i like it i'll check it out what's yeah. your last thing my last one is that i want to just remind our audience me and marissa mullen are heading to normandy in late august um, this, the the, sh the trip is is selling quickly and i i wanted to give a heads up to our listeners that you should definitely Check out the link in the show notes. We're heading to Normandy in uh, in August. Uh, it's a cheese tour, Eliza. Marissa Mullen, you know, author of That Cheese Plate Will Save Your Life, a real cheese expert, and we've kind of crafted this amazing trip, and I'm, I just want to share it with the audience. I mean, it sounds like great. I feel like cheese in Normandy in the summer, what's not like? What's not to love? Normandy's great in the summer because it's just not hot. Like it, it's like a little cooler than the cities, and and really this is like the end of summer. Um, we're going to Mount Saint Michel. We're gonna definitely pick some apples, and like it's like the first pick late August apples too, which is my favorite time to have apples. But we're closing the closing this in a f in few months probably. But definitely check it out. I, I can't wait to to visit Normandy with Marissa Mullen. Sounds great. Thanks for sharing your three things. Anytime. This is Taste is hosted by Eliza Abarbanel and me, Matt Rodbar. The show is produced by Shalia Harris and Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. Theme music by Steve Rydell. Visit Taste online at tastecooking.com and make sure to subscribe to our newsletter for updates on all cool things that are happening. 